As I mentioned yesterday, there was a period of time, as Talon just said, of about three years in which the British, co British uh, government and the colonists got, to, got along pretty well. But there's going to be an event that's going to turn that around, that's going to turn this from doing really well to being incredibly ugly in a short period of time. So our first subtopic of the day is additional conflict between the colonists and Great Britain. Additional conflict between the colonists and Great Britain. So, from that date we talked about yesterday, from 1770 to June 9, 1772, pretty good relationships going on between the colonists and Great Britain. However, on June 9th of 1772, an event happened that would change that forever, that would eventually lead the American colonies in declaring their independence from Great Britain. And it happened at Narragansett Bay, Narragansett Bay, which is on your ID sheet, I believe, off the coast of Rhode Island. So this additional conflict that's going to start a new series of bad feelings between the American colonists and Great Britain happens on June 9, 1772 in Narragansett Bay, which was off the coast of Rhode Island. And this conflict would be between colonists and the British. Now what happened in Narragansett Bay off the coast of Rhode Island on June 9, 1772 is a British naval commander by the name of William Duddingston and his British vessel known as the Gaspé were stopping all colonial ships coming from England. Okay, on June 9, 1772 in Narragansett Bay off the coast of Rhode Island, a British naval commander by the name of William Duddingston and his British vessel, the Gaspé, were stopping all colonial ships coming from England. Now, Austin, why were why was why was British commander William Duddingston and his vessel, the Gaspé, stopping all these colonial ships coming from England? Why would he do that? To check for smuggling. Absolutely, yeah. He was checking their cargo for smuggling, right? Okay. Well, he was kind of an overzealous commander, which tells you that he maybe goes a little over the top. And in his zeal to stop these colonial ships, he ran the gas bay aground off the coast of Narragansett Bay. He got too close to the shoreline and ran the ship aground. Okay. So in his zeal to stop these colonial ships, which he suspected were smuggling goods without paying tax into the colonies, Commander Duddingston runs the gas bay aground off the coast in Narragansett Bay. Now, I don't know if any guys are shipworthy dudes or dudesses, but how's the only way he's going to get that ship off those rocks? I wonder. He's going to have to wait for very good, Cody. He's going to have to wait for the high tide to come in. I'm not a big ocean guy, but there's certain times of the year when, or excuse me, of the day in which the high tide comes in and lifts the water level up, which would free him from these rocks. So he obviously got stuck during low tide. Well, the problem was this uh, high tide that he would need to release his ship would not reach that coastline for nine hours. So it would be approximately 3 o'clock in the morning on June 10th that he would get the high tide that would free him from the rocks that would send him back into the ocean. Okay, So high tide that would release the gas bay would not reach the coastline of Rhode Island for about nine hours after he ran aground and that would be approximately three o'clock in the morning the next day on June 10th is what he was waiting for okay, so he could get out. Well, there was a very wealthy colonial merchant by the name of John Brown who didn't like Commander Duddingston very well, nor did he like his actions in checking all of these American ships, merchant ships coming back from Great Britain. And he gets word that Duddingston's ship is stuck for nine hours aground off the coast of Rhode Island. And the reason this wealthy colonial merchant, John Brown, doesn't like Duddingston is Duddingston's actions of checking his ships are hurting his business. So he decides it's time for a little 
payback. Okay? So, as William Dunnington and the Gas Bay are run off the ground in Narragansett Bay, waiting for high tide that's going to be nine hours away, a colonial merchant by the name of John Brown, very wealthy, who does not like Dunnington or his actions against his merchant ships, finds out that he's going to be stuck there for a period of time and decides, yeah, get a little payback on this guy because his checking my ships has hurt my business. So John Brown calculated that high tide and he knew he would have several hours to get his payback because he would be stuck aground. So he gets together 65 men and he puts them on eight small boats and they make the decision to raid the gas bay. Okay? So John Brown is seaworthy. He knows the high tides in his area because he's a colonial merchant that owns ships. And he knows he's got Dunningston and the gas bay stuck aground for a few hours. And so he puts together himself and 65 other men and they board eight small boats and head to raid the gas bay. They're going to raid the gas bay. Well, these raiding boats reach the gas bay, and British Commander Duddingston comes to view on the deck. They can see Duddingston on the deck through probably some fog or whatever, but they can see him on the deck, okay? Well, one of John Brown's employees or men, a guy by the name of Joseph Buckland, takes it upon his own to aim and fire his musket at Duddingston. Not ordered to by Brown. Okay? So one of Brown's men, one of those 65 men that worked for John Brown, Joseph Buckland, decides that he's going to, on his own, aim and fire his musket at William Duddingston, the British commander of the gas bay. Well, as Duddingston falls on the deck of the gas bay wounded, Brown and his men board the gas bay and capture the crew. So as William Duddyson's lane wounded on the deck after being shot by Joseph Buckland, John Brown's men board the gas bay and capture the crew. So is John Brown and Joseph? John Brown is the boss and Joseph Buckland's the employee. One of the 65 men he grabbed to do this. Well, John Brown, being somewhat of an honorable man, brings a colonial doctor aboard the gas bay who treats Commander Dunningston, and he's going to end up surviving the gunshot. So, they capture the crew. They bring a colonial doctor aboard to make sure that Dunningston does not die from his wounds. And what's in the gas bay? All contraband that they had gathered that smugglers were trying to get in, right? <coughs> so, what John Brown does after he brings in the colonial doctor and treats Commander Dunnyston so he can survive, he orders his men to torch the gas bay, set it afire. Well, <laughs> they're smart enough to get the crew off and they're smart enough to get themselves off because the flames eventually reach the powder magazine of the ship. That's where they would store all their gunpowder, and it completely blow, it explodes or blows up the ship into millions of pieces. I'm not sure that was John Brown's plan, but it made a spectacular appearance. <laughs> you know what I mean? So when the flames reach the powder magazine on the ship, the vessel exploded, and pieces are all over Narragansett Bay. Now, who's mad? Specifically, who's mad? Huh? William Oh, he's mad. He, uh, he's mad. But who bigger than him is mad when they get the news of this? Who's the one the colonists are having trouble? Parliament. When Parliament gets news of this outrageous act on the part of John Brown, they want him captured and punished ASAP. 
So Parliament gets the word that John Brown has done this to William Dunnington, a British commander at the gas bay. And because of the explosion, which was so visible, it got a lot of attention. And Parliament got a hold of that, and they demanded immediately the capture and punishment of John Brown and those 65 men. Now, it's going to be a little bit different. Remember when they tried the, the eight uh, soldiers during the Boston Massacre, right? Where were they tried? Where were those British soldiers tried? In, in the colonies, right? Well, the difference was Parliament wanted these guys caught and taken where for trial? England. Back to England. Okay? So they were demanding that these men be caught or captured and brought back to England for trial. Yep. Uh, so this is the first day, as you said, Parliament. What is Parliament? It's like Parliament is like the American Congress. Like you have a president of the United States, and then you have a House of Representatives and the Senate to make the laws. It's like their government. It's their government. Okay. Parliament's like our Congress. Only they have a king a instead of a president. What's that? And then no, it feels like a guy. Oh, no, it's a big, it's a, the prime minister is the guy, it's a little bit different. The United States has a president who works with Congress, but has the power to veto what Congress does. And the, and the one that leads Congress, you have a Speaker of the House of Representatives, and you have a Senate Majority Leader who control those two branches, but you don't have anyone over both, you know what I mean, so to speak. Well, in England, you're ruled by a monarchy, a king and queen, but the government actually is called Parliament, and they elect a prime minister to run Parliament. Good question. Yeah. So Parliament's very, the king and queen don't take a lot of interest in the government. They don't make a lot of decisions. They're more interested in the public relations of the whole thing, whereas the Parliament runs the country. Do they communicate with the king and queen? Sure. But do the king and queen leave that duty up to Parliament? They don't get involved too much. Like the presidents are involved with Congress, then the king and queen are involved with Parliament. Well, anyway, Parliament makes it clear these guys are going to be brought back to England for trial. Fortunately for Brown and his men, they were never caught. But what did it do? It inflamed relations between what? The colonists and Great Britain again. Okay? So Brown and his men were never caught. But it did not improve relations, which brings us to our next subtopic, which is the Tea Act of 1773. The Tea Act of 1773. Well, what happened? We had a little bit of a bad instance, right? In Narragansett Bay. So in 1773, the American colonists were again brought to the edge of rebellion by something the British Parliament did. So in 1773, the British Parliament does something that brings the American colonists again to the edge of rebellion. In other words, it upsets them. And what was that thing that Parliament did that upset the colonists so much, Wyatt? What did Parliament do in 1773 that brought the American colonists to the edge of rebellion. It's a subtopic. They passed yeah. the Tea Act of 1773. Now, to be honest with you, the only reason Parliament passed the Tea Act of 1773 uh, was to show the American colonists after the incident in Narragansett Bay that we can tax you even though you don't think we can. So it was more of an aggravating type tax again, right? Matter of fact, it wasn't really that big of a tax, but the point was, you screwed up, you shouldn't have done what you did in Narragansett Bay, now we're gonna put another tax on you to show you that we can tax you and you're under our thumb. That was really the purpose for the tax. So after the repeal of the Townsend Acts, British government initiated the Tea Act of 1773. This tax was administered by Parliament simply to prove the point that they had the power to tax the colonies. And the tax was a very small one on tea, right? And even though it was, didn't amount to much, the colonists refused to pay it for the principle of the whole thing, right? So you got two stubborn sides, don't you? You got part of it saying we're going to stick this tax on you because we can. And even though it was a small tax and they probably should have just paid it and not complain, the colonists ruffled up their feathers and said, no, we're not paying it. We don't care how small it is. We're not paying it. Well, in addition to refusing to pay the tax on tea, colonial merchants decide again to boycott 
the purchase of tea only from Great Britain. They didn't sign non-importation agreements that barred trade. They just made it clear, no, no, in addition to not paying your tax tea, your tea tax, excuse me, we're not going to import any more tea from Great Britain either. You can stick that tea right where the sun doesn't shine, is basically what they said. So even though the tax on tea was a small one, many colonies refused to pay it. In addition to refusing to pay the tax on tea, colonial merchants decided they would boycott the purchase of any tea from Great Britain. So, they're producing all this tea, and the most famous tea producing company in Great Britain was the East India Tea Company. East India Tea Company. And what happened? They kept producing this tea, but it wasn't going to the American colonies, so Dominic, where did all this tea end up? In Britain, in their warehouses, just stacking up and stacking up and stacking up and not being sold. And the one that was getting hurt the most, as I mentioned, was the East India Tea Company. They were the big tea producers in Great Britain, and they're not selling any more tea to the, the American colonies, which is their biggest buyer, and all of a sudden their warehouses are just getting stacked with unused or unsold tea. So large amounts of unsold tea were piling up in the East India Company's warehouses in Great Britain. Well, what's going to happen? They're gonna, if they're not selling goods, they're going to go bankrupt, and they were about to go bankrupt, and. So who did they turn to to try to help them bail them out? All the car dealerships in America, except for Ford Motor Company, did this during the President Obama years. Who did they turn to to bail them out of their bankruptcy? Who did, who did the car companies other than Ford turn to to bail them out of bankruptcy during the latter Bush years and early Obama years? The President, the government, right? So who did these East India uh, tea company. They went to Parliament and said, hey, we got, you got to help bail us out here. We're going bankrupt. So forced with the possibility of bankruptcy, the East India Company turned to Parliament for help. You think they helped them? No. They did. Why did they help them? They were very eager to help them. I mean, they were more than happy to help them. They were, matter of fact, going out of their way to help them. Why? Because they make a law that America has to get the tea. And that means they have to pay the tax, too. A good guess, but more personal than that. Why were they just eager as can be to let them lend them money so they wouldn't go bankrupt? So that they would have partial like, ownership. Well, not yeah. partial. The, you're close. Okay. Most of Parliament had ownership in the East India Tea Company. So who was going bankrupt besides them, besides the tea company? Parliament. Parliament. Members of Parliament were stockholders. Very good. So. Many of the members of Parliament owned stock in the East India uh, Tea Company, so they were quick to act, and they lent the East India Company a large sum of money so they could continue their business. But still, that's not going to solve the problem in the colonies unless the East India Company does something to circumvent what the colonists are doing. So they made a decision. Now, I'll give you an example. Where do you think Kent Folger gets the groceries that he sells you. Does he just grow them? No. Where does he get them? Costco. Well, not Costco, but he gets them probably from Food Services of America. So it's kind of a weird chain of events. Farmers sell to people that produce. People that produce sell to like the Food Services of America. Food Services of America sell to Kent Folger. Kent Folger sells to you. Well, there's some, several middlemen in there, do you see? It wouldn't be like Kent is buying his uh, groceries straight from the farmers, not all these other middlemen, and then selling it. As a result of the fact that this person gives it to this person, so whoever gets it from the farmers is going to charge the next person a little more because he had to pay the farmers, and that person that sells to the Food Services of America is going to charge Food Services of America a little more because he had to pay the other person, and Food Services of America, you think they just give that food to Kent Folger to sell? No, they sell to him as a profit, and then he sells it to you as a profit. He's not running the store there and not making money. But do you think he, part of the price on a half a gallon of milk at the store might be because he has to make up his payment from Food Services of America? Sure it does. So what the East India Tea Company did is they decided to quit selling to colonial merchants and sell directly to the colonists. Then there's no middleman, right? Well, do you... Now, why, you're a loyal guy, but if I sold tractors and I wanted you to give me 10000 for a tractor and Cody 
Oberyn Matizzi sold tractors, and he only wanted 5,000 for a tractor, as much as you love me. Are you going to spend twice as much to buy a tractor from me? No, that, you're not. I mean, that's the thing. Another story I'll give you, it's kind of off cuff. When I was a school su superintendent in Montana, we used to buy our milk, little milk cartons for our lunchroom from a local business. And I was, I was happy to pay a little more to buy it from him locally than I was to buy it in Billings, okay? Well, pretty soon he raised his prices where the milks were twice as much money to buy from him than I could buy it in Billings. Well, Montana's a little different on finances compared to Wyoming, and so that was a big difference. So I called the guy and said, listen, I just can't pay twice as much for this milk from you as I do in Billings. That's just not fiscally responsible as superintendent of schools for my school district. You're going to have to compete a little better. He wouldn't do it. He's stubborn. He thought I would fold. Well, I couldn't fold. As much as I like the guy and like to buy locally, I can't justify the taxpayer that I'm paying twice as much money for something. So, you know, if he'd have been, you know, 10 cents more than the milk I could buy in Billings instead of 25, I would have absolutely bought from him. You see what I'm saying? You know what I paid more. Well, it's the same concept here. These tea company, this tea company in Great Britain, they don't have a middleman. They don't have to sell to the merchants, see? They can sell much cheaper to the colonists, okay? Well, who's going to go out of business now? Yeah. Colonial merchants. So, basically what happens is the East India Company makes the decision to bypass colonial merchants and sell their tea directly to American colonists. Because of this, price of tea would drop for the colonists as there was no middleman to deal with. There was no colonial merchant to charge the colonists for their having to pay for the tea from Britain. Does that make sense? So they could sell it cheaper. So if this continues, these colonial merchants are going to be driven out of business. Now, 